Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our audience here in person and to our audience who's join, jo joining us uh, through the live stream. Welcome. I'm Roy Kamphausen, president of MBR. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's discussion of Taiwan's defense priorities and challenges, the PRC's increasing military pressure on Taiwan, exercises increasingly close to Taiwan's shores, and ongoing Chinese military modernization geared towards Taiwan have highlighted the need to further develop and improve Taiwan's defensive capabilities. China's aggressive response to Speaker Pelosi's visit last summer and the lessons the PRC might be absorbing from Russia's invasion of Ukraine raise questions about the prospect of conflict in the Taiwan Strait. These events have provoked reactions in Taiwan and around the world, creating more momentum for defense reforms in Taiwan, as well as increased support for Taiwan's defense in both Washington and Tokyo, among other places. And so with that backdrop in mind, we have a unique opportunity today to hear from Admiral Phil Davidson, former commander of US Indo-Pacific Command, in discussion with my MBR colleague and Vice President of Research, Ali Sawinski, and I believe they'll be joining us here in a minute. Admiral Davidson recently returned from his first trip to Taiwan as part of an NBR delegation, which included Ali and our other colleague, Rachel Bernstein, whom you'll hear from as well today. This delegation, part of a longstanding NBR effort, met with leaders across Taiwan's government and civil society to strengthen bilateral understanding and exchange perspectives, particularly on the defense and security of the island. So I expect that much of the discussion today will be informed by those recent dis conversations and experiences in Taiwan. Following their discussion, the sort of fireside chat format that we have here, Rachel Bernstein will moderate a panel discussion featuring our former MBR colleague, Tiffany Ma, Jim Schof of Susquehanna Peace Foundation and Kitch Liao of Atlantic Council, that seeks to better understand Taiwan's defense needs and capabilities and the role that the United States and Japan can play in supporting Taiwan's defense and deterring conflict in the Taiwan Strait. So thanks to my MBR colleagues, Ali, Rachel, and Audrey Mossberger, as well as the rest of our team for helping to organize today's event. Thanks to all of you who have joined us virtually. We hope this is a, a great session for you as well. So I'd like to introduce Admiral Davidson for those who don't know um, as they come onto this stage. Admiral Phil Davidson is the 25th commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, serving from 2018 to 2021. And that's not actually accurate. I think Admiral can correct us. I think you're the first commander of Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, yeah, I, that's yeah. fair. Um, the 25th commanding that critical theater. He previously served as commander of US Fleet Forces Command and as commander of US Sixth Fleet. He's a native of St. Louis, Missouri, can have a moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> He's a 1982 graduate, graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He's a surface warfare officer who deployed across the globe, I love this line, in frigates, destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers uh, throughout his storied 40-year career, I think. Almost. He also served earlier in his career and at other points in policy, strategy, and operations billets, in multiple tours, on the U.S. Pacific Fleet staff, U.S. Navy staff, and U.S. Joint Staff, as well as his senior military advisor in the State Department at one point in his career. And he was the Navy's military aide to the Vice President of the United States. Ali and Admiral Davidson, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Can you all hear me? Great. All right, I'm going to pick up pretty much straight from uh, that wonderful introduction from Roy um, and noting that uh, Admiral Davidson, uh, you've just within the past six weeks or so uh, returned from your first uh, trip to Taiwan, to actually being able to visit the island and have some meetings uh, with Taiwanese government officials, kind of hear perspectives. Um, and so I just want to start from there and hear any of your kind of key takeaways from that visit uh, and any reflections on Cross Strait, U.S. Taiwan. Um, U.S.-China relations. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Ali. Uh, and thank you to the 
National Bureau of Asian Research for the delegation and the, the fine care both uh, during the visit and, and after. Um, the visit to Taiwan was, of course, you know, very impactful for me. It was my first ever visit to Taiwan. Um, and having a little bit of time in the rearview mirror, you know, meaning since I retired in, in uh, uh, May of 2021, um, little experience behind me, it was, it was good to go in kind of eyes wide open to, to see everything that we could see. So um, we spent time, most of our time in Taipei, and then we spent a brief amount of time in Kaohsiung. And, you know, the thing that is so striking f that I'd like to convey to the other military folks who, you know, seldom get to travel to Taiwan, if at all, um, is that it's a robust, vibrant, energetic people um, who have done a lot with the resources that they have and uh, made, a, you know, an example for what a free people can accomplish. Um, I was thoroughly impressed with um, the infrastructure, um, the manufacturing capability that's there, you know, the, the transportation system, whether it's a bullet train or whether it was the infrastructure of the highways and things like that, it was all just phenomenal. And um, the people of Taiwan could not have been warmer nor, or more welcoming to us. It was fabulous. Um, uh, second, I would say that um, it was adequately described to us that uh, they believe the security environment that they've observed in the last two years is the most severe that they've seen in, in 70 odd years. Um, I think that you know, bears internalizing um, both in the United States and Taiwan as well, uh, and with um, other uh, allies of the United States and, and partners of, of um, all in the country. Um, I, and you know, that has to be embraced for what it's worth. Um, I think there's been a couple of events uh, over the course of the last five years that have been galvanizing um, to the Taiwan people um, that have helped them focus on this very uh, severe environment. You know, first was the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong, what that meant that profoundly affected the 2020 election uh, in Taiwan. And I think it began to shape the, uh, the concern about the security environment. And then, you know, without question has been Russia's assault on Ukraine. Um, I think that has been pretty well internalized and focused absolutely at the political level and at the, at the civic um, challenge that's before them uh, for the challenge that it is. Um, they're very focused on their ability to deter and defend. They're very focused on their resiliency, uh, their ability to you know, stockpile where it's necessary um, diversify where it's necessary, you know, for example, in energy and things like that, um, and internalize the threats in a way that then focuses their um, defense investments um, uh, to the needs of, as my friend Jim Schaff says, the day-to-day -day as well as, you know, the worst possible day. Um, they have some needs when it comes to organizational constructs, I believe. They have some needs when it comes to training. Um, uh, and I think they still have a ways to go on some strategic infrastructure investment. Um, but um, it, 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 was, it was clear to me that Hong Kong and Ukraine was galvanizing their attention. And you see it manifest in things like the, the new conscription policy and things like that. Uh, and then the last thing I would add is that they're grateful for their partnership, their partnership with the United States, certainly, but also the partnership and the increasing attention that the international community has been paying to Taiwan. Again, I think in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, it's uh, something that the people of Taiwan have, have embraced uh, closely. Um, they're grateful for that attention. and. Um, I think that's helping shape their engagements uh, with others as well as, you know, how they're internalizing the security environment and the solutions they need to address uh, to get there. So. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, I started in, I uh, threw my, my softball question at you first. So we'll jump to uh, kind of into some of the meat of the themes that you've already really 
touched on here, mm -hmm. some of the defense reforms, you know, questions about how to manage that day-to-day -day versus the worst day. Um, before we jump into all of those, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, a question I'm sure you get all the time, um, which is about your, your 2021 testimony mm -hmm. in front of Congress. Um, on China's capabilities and uh, willingness to use force against Taiwan, um, which has been, you know, the subject of great discussion here in Washington, I'm sure um, as well in, in Taipei and around the world. So I want to give you opportunity just to share some of your insights on uh, your assessment of the, the threat to Taiwan and the prospect for conflict mm -hmm. in the Taiwan Strait and uh, the uh, assessment of that timeline. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then maybe touch on what kind of factors led you to, to the conclusions mm -hmm. that, that you've made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't go anywhere without a window being uh, mentioned to me, right? So I, it's a good thing Marvin is out of business. Uh, um, my name is, <laughs> has taken place of it. Um, and it's also fascinating to me how, you know, some things can just kind of catch fire and, and become part of the, uh, the zeitgeist, you know, of the day. Um, the question I was asked was by Senator Sullivan in March of 2021. He, he made some observations about some of the things that have been transpiring in the Asia Pacific region uh, in the security environment vis-a-vis um, -vis the PRC especially and, and asked me what I thought about what that meant to a timeline on any potential conflict, which is a quote. Um, going forward. And I said that the, I thought the threat was manifest this decade, and in fact, I was concerned about the next six years. Um, the dates that have kind of come up since then, 2027 or 2025 or whatever, I, you know, are kind of mox nicks in my view. I mean, I, I think the people only need to look at the comments of the Director of National Intelligence in this country or the Secretary of State to, you know, understand, you know, kind of the currency of the threat, um, to be sure. And I think, you know, the really bad thing about focusing on a date here is it sets aside, you know, the actual risk that's inherent that has come through in all these discussions uh, from leaders. And that is the risk is manifest this decade. What is it uh, what we're going to do as an international community? What is it we're going to do, uh, you know, as a country? What is it that Taiwan needs to do um, to sustain the status quo going forward? Um, and I think, you know, there's great alignment between all the statements about this, that the risk is essentially this decade and now. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I think that's, again, a great segue to take us into a discussion of what we do need to do to be prepared uh, for, uh, for that potential threat. Um, and in the U.S. Uh, and in Taipei, there have been a lot of discussion um, and pretty active debate over you know what what Taiwan needs to do, what are what is the best uh, way for it to bolster its defenses? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on on this debate about um, Taiwan prioritizing kind of the asymmetric options versus um, conventional capabilities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my response in short is it needs both, right? Uh, and it is the difference between the day to day and the worst day. And while I believe the potential for conflict is indeed, you know, this decade and, you know, the description by the PRC that reunification with Taiwan is a core interest of the PRC, you know, just can't be ignored, right? But I think for Taiwan, I think for the international community, um, you know, what you want to do is prevent a fight. And this is where the tension becomes between conventional capabilities and asymmetric capabilities. And I think one only need to look a little bit at Russia, Ukraine, um, to understand this. Um, Ukraine was very well equipped with um, capabilities uh, to be used in case Russia attacked. Um, not so well equipped with capabilities to prevent an attack by Russia. Um, again, I, I, while the potential for conflict is in this decade, I don't think that's the PRC's preferred course of action. I believe they would rather see um, the day-to-day -day capabilities of Taiwan and its ability to respond to provocations like violations of the air defense identification zone, like midline crossings, like circumnavigations of uh, Taiwan with bombers and other forces. They would like to erode the conventional capability that Taiwan has 
that's necessary in order to deter a fight um, in hopes that you know, Taiwan capability would just collapse. So there has to be both going forward. One of the other things, and this is anecdotal, um, but it, it, it kind of clear to me observing the Russia-Ukraine conflict was the early dialogue that tanks are not survivable anymore. We have all these little drones attacking tanks. And now here we are actually 13 months uh, into learning lessons from this fight. And, you know, the direct quotes are, if you see a tank, we need a tank. And uh, we're responding with that kind of capability in order to prevent, you know, deeper provocations by Russia. Um, so, you know, important to internalize going forward. I, I know that's hard. People want easy choices here um, to make, a, you know, a supreme tactical investment um, that solves all problems, but it doesn't. There are no silver bullets in this game, and it's going to take robust investment by Taiwan, and it's going to, I believe, take uh, some investment and some collaboration coordination with the international community to ensure that Taiwan has what it needs. Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned earlier that there have been a few kind of shifts and turning points um, for Taiwan, one of which uh, is Hong Kong, and then much more recently, uh, the situation with Ukraine that has really pushed forward and perhaps accelerated some uh, long discussed uh, defense reforms taking place mm -hmm. in Taiwan. So there have been reforms around uh, military uh, service. Um, there have been reforms increasing the defense budget um, and certainly a lot of focus around training mm -hmm. um, on what Taiwan needs to do um, or how it can focus on really preparing and training um, in the ways that it needs to um, to be prepared. So, you know, we had, you know, lots of good conversations with counterparts in Taiwan while we were there about um, implementing some of these reforms. Um, what is your kind of takeaway, your assessment of um, how effective these reforms will be and what additional steps kind of still remain for Taiwan to really get where it needs to mm -hmm. be? Well, training was one thing uh, I thought we heard loud and clear that they felt they needed more of, both, you know, training internal to uh, Taiwan forces and in Taiwan, but also uh, training and ranges that might be available to them external to Taiwan as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, having experience as a combatant commander in this country, you know, there are needs at, at the st strategic level and operational level and down to the tactical level there when it comes to training, right? The strategic level, it would be, you know, the national security processes, how it interacts, you know, the political level with the, the military level, the uniform level to actually you know, bring about changes, um, to, to execute actions that might be necessary, uh, those kind of things. But certainly then operational level training, need some more jointness uh, certainly in, in Taiwan, but all the way down to the tactical level too, which we've long had a deep you know, training relationship at the tactical and the operational level as well. Um, so I think that needs to be sustained. Uh, I mentioned organizational construct uh, before I, you know, the U.S. has been on a nearly 40-year journey now on joint operations and, and all the good and bad that comes with that. And, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to all these things. Um, that's an area in which I th think we can help. And frankly, we, we have allies as well who are asking for um, some assistance there. And, um, I, I think that would be, you know, really important work uh, going forward. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So, yeah. um, so another element, perhaps, uh, in addition to uh, the, the reforms that the government is undertaking, um, certainly focus on training within the military, um, but another element that we heard about is kind of a shift in the way that um, the public or uh, the broader kind of civic institutions are thinking about mm -hmm. now um, Taiwan's defense. Can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit to kind of what you might have uh, heard or your thoughts on yeah. uh, how the population in Taiwan is prepared to potentially face um, a threat in, you know, this, in this next decade? Yeah. Well, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I think they've got a really clear-eyed view of the security environment, and they described it as the most severe two years that they've had since uh, since the late 40s. And, um, uh, you know, having the population internalize that, um, 
I don't think has been too much of a challenge, again, in the wake of Hong Kong and the implementation of the national security law and, again, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, but uh, that said, uh, there's, you know, my takeaway from, from many of our counterparts there was there was uh, issues of resiliency um, that needed to happen at the civil, civic level um, in terms of power, you know, logistical distribution, you know, in crisis. You know, these are all hard lessons being learned in Ukraine. And, um, uh, it, you know, the resources, the reserves uh, is the right way to say it, um, in terms of fuel and oil and water and all those things that are required as well. Um, and then the idea that you need a core reserve um, to help with civil defense. And, you know, it's striking when you visit Taiwan how much, how widespread the population is, how robust it is across the, the whole of the island. And having that, you know, civil resiliency and response were it to be necessary in conflict, I think is critical. And I, and I think that's where you've seen uh, the new conscription policy you know, be broadly accepted um, across Taiwan at this point. Um, there's a lot to happen there. I would say, you know, there's a lot in every country that has to happen there. When you start to think about cyber defenses and how, your, how cyber intersects with your critical infrastructure like power and water and sewage and all these things that uh, many of us take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and, and be inculcated, and I think Taiwan has that challenge before it, as I would submit that any nation does when they're thinking about their self-defense. So, so uh, then I would turn a little bit to uh, what we think of kind of the U.S. role here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Taiwan is implementing its own reforms, thinking about um, some of the hard questions that you just mentioned in terms of bolstering resiliency. Um, you know, what is the U.S.'s role in kind of supporting Taiwan's defense? Um, what, what are you seeing in terms of uh, either what's being done congressionally or, um, you know, what, what DOD is supporting in terms of the training that we've already mentioned? Um, but what the, can the U.S. do to kind of further bolster and support Taiwan in these efforts? Well, you know, our relationship is, you know, firmly rooted in the Taiwan Relations Act. And, you know, keeping, our, keeping that as our bellwether, I think, is the most important thing the United States needs to do. Um, I think others in the international community are waking up to the potential of what a crisis uh, in the, the East China Sea would mean for the region. Um, you know, when you see advancements in the U.S. alliance structure, whether it's AUKUS with Australia or the announcements made by Japan in December uh, on their own national security needs as well as um, the alliance uh, advancements we made in January, you know, these are people waking up to the threat and the course of action of what the PRC's been up to, um, not just vis-a-vis -vis the Tiwan Strait, but across the region broadly. Um, and they're worried about their own security environments and what changes might mean to them. Um, you know, should should the security environment change in a in a very dramatic fashion? Um, you know that that has meant profound changes for Australia and Japan is just an example. Um, you know, I think um, um, you know the resiliency actions that Taiwan has undertaken. You know, many of those are lessons for others in the region. Um, there are certainly investments that I, you know, on the record for, and you know, we don't have enough time in the day to talk about what I believe needs to happen in the U.S. defense uh, apparatus. You know, felt pretty w uh, well supported by the development of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative and and what it's meant and the investments that were made there. Um, I, I would say, lastly, and really to put what I believe is probably the most important point on this, is what I heard on every engagement I ever did when I was the commander, and what I hear persistently in my travels to the region today is that deepening the economic relationship between the United States and others in the region 
is the most important thing that the United States could do to sustain <laughs> the economic relationships and, importantly, because I think they're related, the security relationships in the region. That is a tough, tough, tough political lift uh, here in the United States. Um, but in many respects, um, without understanding um, how deeply uh, dependent the United States is on its economic relationships with, all, with Asia, how Asia is evolving demographically, two-thirds of the world's population and two-thirds of the global economy is going to be centered on Asia by 2030. You know, internalizing that for this country and, um, you know, having the wherewithal to have some hard conversations about this, I, I think, is critically important. And it would demonstrate to the region that the U.S. is a Pacific power that's here to stay. Wonderful. I think uh, that's a great point on which uh, to pause and see if our audience has any questions. We have about 15 minutes remaining. Um, and so we'll take a few questions here um, and kind of see where that takes us. Um, so I, I have a question here. Yeah, hi, Admiral. Uh, this is Tina Chong with Voice of America's Chinese branch. Uh, I'd like to know uh, your uh, assessment of uh, the readiness of Taiwan's military forces. Uh, you, we, you talked about Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, invasion and Ukraine. Uh, people all know that uh, they took about uh, eight years in uh, 2014 uh, for uh, the international community or the U.S. to train them. What do you think uh, the uh, military in Taiwan can hold out in the event of a conflict? Uh, uh, the readiness th that they have right now. Thank you. Well, I did go to uh, Kaohsiung and, and met with the, the fleet commander and observed uh, some of the ships, uh, one in particular, a uh, ship I was actually well familiar with um, from, from its time and duty in the United States Navy. Um, and the ship was in marvelous shape. Um, it did have some modifications to its uh, combat systems that I thought were important. Um, but the most important thing that I observed is it had a, had a captain of the ship, and it had a wardroom of junior officers, male and female, and uh, a crew of petty officers, male and female, that I thought were just aces. I mean, they understood their equipment, they knew they were taking excellent good care of it, and they were committed to the mission as well. Um, not long after I departed the ship, the ship actually put, put back to sea um, to continue doing its duties. I could also see on the base that there was a robustness to the maintenance infrastructure. There was a ship in dry dock, you know, getting uh, repairs and, and uh, modification, which is important. And they had some frontline ships that had um, come from other nations as well, France uh, and the United States included. Um, and I got to see the brand new um, resupply ship that they have there too, which uh, it was across the harbor, but it looked like it was in fabulous shape. So I thought the spirits were high. Um, there was uh, very good focus on what the missions were, and um, they were deeply concerned about the security of Taiwan uh, themselves going forward. So I was quite impressed. Yeah, I won't make that assessment right here. Thank you. So. All right, right in the front. Uh, hi, Admiral. So Michael Gordon from the Wall Street Journal. Hi, Michael. Um, so uh, you mentioned the U.S. defense effort toward the end of this discussion. Um, how would you um, assess where how the U.S. is doing in meeting the challenge, not only of a potential uh, Chinese amphibious attack, but also of other actions such as a blockade or other forms of military harassment, what, what heartens you in terms of implementation of the NDS? And where do you think there, there might be more emphasis and are you satisfied with the pace of the efforts at the Pentagon, both in the Davidson window and in <laughs> longer term? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Michael, it's a hard conversation to have, right? No commander ever gets everything they've ever wanted, right? Going back in the history of this uh, nation. Um, I, I think the Congress here has, you know, opened the door uh, to addressing these issues. One, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, I, I think, was the, you know, kind of the first steps off the line to make sure that the equities of the Indo-Pacific 
uh, components and all that stuff were addressed. Um, I would say the next thing is, is you know, now the selection of a, a House committee on, on China. Um, I think that's going to help, you know, further and deepen the dialogue here. Um, you know, the, 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 the first thing I would say is it's a joint fight in the Pacific. Um, I think uh, that still holds true. The needs broadly that need to be addressed are issues of lethality. Um, that comes to range and sensing. There are issues of our posture and our maneuver in the region. That has to do with our fixed base structure, our ability to relocate in a short amount of time. It has to do with our ability to have uh, the kind of fires network that would be able to integrate um, uh, uh, offensive capabilities of the U.S. Joint Force um, at much longer ranges, given the capabilities that are coming, against much more dynamic maneuvering targets than, than we've been able to in the past. I, I think that's an issue. There's an issue of logistics and sustainment that needs to be addressed as well. <laughs> and then lastly is strengthening our allies and partners. Um, and you can see that there's, you know, strong efforts going on there when it, when it comes to AUKUS, when it comes to uh, announcements made um, in our alliance with Japan. Uh, and one of the things I neglected to mention earlier comes into steady arms sales to Taiwan. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, not having an approach every year gets in the way of these things proceeding smoothly. Um, having an on-time appropriation along with the authorization you know, helps smooth that path uh, so that those things are consistent and persistent and addresses the kind of needs I was talking about. Their ability to deter in the day-to-day -day and, you know, their ability to defend on their worst day as well. Great. All right. We have a gentleman here in the second row. Uh, Bill Wu. I'm from uh, North America Taiwanese Professional Association. Uh, question is, like, Taiwan has been buying a lot of weapons. And this is one thing I had a conversation with the Chinese national. He actually challenged me, say, you got a sucker. Because you pay so much money, but you can't get your weapon because the, uh, there's a shortage, there's a supply, there's a lot of problem. So I need, uh, from your end, next time when I encounter this kind of question, how do I respond to the guy say, I mean, this is not a safe boy, you know? <laughs> He going to get your beep. No, this is not. But I, I, I was kind of stuck when he said that. I said, okay, I really don't have a good answer. But I'm sure, how would you uh, take care of those type of question? Um, I want to make sure I understood correctly. His, his issue was... You pay the money. The Taiwanese government had already paid mm -hmm. a lot of money. They were a big chunk of money sitting in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe the defense or whatever the... Uh, uh, down the water, they have the mm -hmm. money already, mm -hmm. but they haven't been able to deliver the yeah. merchandise. Also. Yeah, yeah. So they was they was well, The KMT is not happy making fun of the DPP, mm -hmm. and the Chinese making fun of us. Mm -hmm. so, okay, you know, yeah. That's what they were saying. Well, I, I don't want to get into the internal politics of uh, Taiwan, but uh, you know these, and I think the Russia-Ukraine conflict has revealed this, right? You know, what is the capacity? Uh, of Western nations to produce, particularly munitions, you know, rapidly and uh, get them to the field, right? And the other issues that have, uh, are revealing themselves are if you deepen an alliance like a U.S.-Australia or a U.S.-Japan alliance, you know, what now can industry do um, collaboratively, cooperatively, by direction um, to actually move forward and help mitigate these kind of issues, whether it's, you know, offensive fires, you know, all kinds of issues of munitions or sustainment. There has to be, you know, a deepening partnership between industry and the governments to deliver on these things going forward. Um, I think much of what gets in the way of, you know, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan is, is actually the metering of those from the political level as opposed to industry's response. I could be wrong about this, so I would submit it. But I, uh, you know, I think that has to smooth as well. And that needs to come from commitment at the political level and a smooth appropriation. Um, and then I think we need partnership in industry to move forward on some of these issues. All right, um, back here in the corner. 
Hi, Jill Zwicker. I'm from the World Resources Institute, and I, I'm just curious. For I'm sorry, I didn't you. hear where you were from. World Resources Institute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe a different background than most folks in the room. But um, curious to hear from your conversations that you had with folks on the ground, how they're thinking about the issue of energy resiliency. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned it um, earlier, but I just got back from Taiwan and spoke to a lot of folks from a bunch of different fields, and everyone seems to acknowledge that it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, they're entirely, almost entirely, like 97% uh, import dependent in terms of their fossil fuel for their energy usage. And they have semiconductor factories that consume a lot of energy. Um, and, you know, they have a single grid for the entire island, mm -hmm. which is how those widespread blackouts happen. But I, I'm, in my conversations, it seemed to be an issue, but no one was able to provide any insights on what they're actually doing to address that, mm -hmm. the energy security, the energy resiliency issue. So mm -hmm. just curious if you had any conversations with folks along those lines, what they said. Thanks. Yeah, just really one. And, and we didn't talk about this robustly, um, but... Uh, we had been talking about the, the decision to denuclearize in the wake of the, the Fukushima uh, accident. And, you know, that now combined with things that they were observing and learning uh, from Russia, Ukraine, and others, you know, was giving them cause to diversify the grid, um, diversify some of the fossil fuel dependency, which, you know, frankly, there's not a way to get around that, right? They have to either change their storage calculus, which they talked about, but they have to bring it in from the outside. Or boost their and uh, I'm sorry, what? Or boost their renewable energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as, w as well. Um, but those were all issues that, you know, they were springing from the discussion and the decision to denuclearize in the wake of Fukushima, but they were allowing that to be informed by the, the currency of the strategic environment, which I thought was important. That was, that was really my takeaway from it. Um, I think we can also take one or two questions online if we have a few coming in. Um, do you want to read one? Yeah. So Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen is going to transit through America next week on our visit to Central America, and Taiwan's military says it has made preparations for any possible Chinese military moves. How do you think Beijing will respond to President Tsai's travels while she's in the United States? And will the PLA conduct military exercises much like what they did last year in response to then Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit as well? Thank yeah, you. I, I won't speculate on the decisions that President Tsai has made here. Um, you know, I, they have a clear eyed understanding of the dynamics in the geopolitical environment and the politics of Taiwan and PRC and the international community, and they're thinking through it uh, quite, you know, uh, robustly. I, um, you know, you can, you can watch the, the changes that have occurred over the last six months to know that um, the routine activities of the political apparatus in any country is used as an excuse by the PRC to do whatever they want to do. Um, and the change in the security environment that, you know, is somewhat noted over the last six months, that's just the PRC using uh, last August as an excuse as opposed to any change in the status quo or um, any political discussion from Taiwan or the United States or elsewhere. Thank you very much, Admiral. Uh, Russell Shaw with the Global Taiwan Institute. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights uh, from your recent trip to Taiwan. Um, you mentioned several times in your uh, remarks about the need for um, or the importance of appropriations. So I want to ask you a question about appropriations. Uh, in the context of FMF grants versus loans to Taiwan, um, as I think um, many people who watch Taiwan knows, the NDAA authorized $2 billion in FMF. Uh, loans, uh, FMF to Taiwan, but the appropriation only um, allocated loans, uh, FMF loans to Taiwan. And now in the most recent budget request submitted by the Biden administration, there was, I think, a line item in there for just a little over one mil 100 million uh, of FMF, uh, potential FMF, uh, that maybe uh, could be perhaps allocated to Taiwan. Do you think that that is sufficient? And what is, what is your position on the overall utility 
of grants versus loans uh, uh, FMF to Taiwan. Yeah, I think both grants and loans are necessary. Um, I think um, our investments vis-a-vis -vis FMF and FMS should be higher than they are. All right, wonderful. So we are about at time, um, and I want to thank you, Admiral Davidson, so much for spending so much time with us, answering these questions, and reflecting on your, your, uh, your opportunities in Taiwan. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful panel discussion now uh, to dive into some of these issues further, hear a little bit also about what some, uh, some of our strongest allies in the region might do to support Taiwan's defense. Um, so give us just a few minutes to reset the stage here, um, and then we'll kick off that panel discussion. Thank you. Down so there. I'm going to have you speak first, okay. um, and then Kitch and... All right, as people start to trickle back in, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. But um, thank you to Ali and Admiral Davidson both for that really insightful discussion. And it was a pleasure to be on that trip as well. 
Um, so now we're going to turn over to our panel discussion where we're joined by three fantastic panelists um, who will share reflections on Taiwan's defense needs and capabilities and the role that un the United States and Japan can play in supporting Taiwan's defense and deter a conflict in the Taiwan Strait. So I'll introduce the panelists now and in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, so starting with you, Tiffany. Um, Tiffany Ma is the senior director at Bauer Group Asia, where she directs analysis and activities designed to advise Fortune 500 companies on public policy issues, regional geopolitics, and stakeholder management. Tiffany is an expert on Asia-Pacific security studies. She regularly writes and speaks on China-Taiwan relations, U.S.-China relations, and Asia-Pacific maritime security. Her research and analysis has been incorporated into regular briefings with decision makers, including the Department of Defense, Department of State, and members of Congress. And as Roy mentioned, prior to joining BGA, Tiffany was the Senior Director for Political and Security Affairs at NBR. All right, uh, Kitch Liao is an Assistant Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. Prior to joining the Atlantic Council, Liao worked in U.S. Congress, in diplomatic postings, and as a Cyber Intelligence Analyst for the private sector. He's also the Cyber and Military Affairs Consultant for Taiwan's DoubleThink Lab. He has worked on various projects with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, Institute for National Defense and Security Research in Taiwan, the U.S. Department of Defense in Jane's on topics including Taiwan's order of battle, China's chemical, biological, and radiological and nuclear capability, and Chinese disinformation and cyber espionage operations. And last but not least, Jim Schaff is Senior Director of the U.S.-Japan Next Alliance Initiative at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. As leader of this initiative, he fosters networking and the development of joint recommendations involving a wide range of policy and technical specialists in and out of government and to stimulate new alliance connections across foreign security and technology policy areas. Jim was also a member of the Taiwan delegation um, earlier this year, accompanying me, Ali, and Admiral Davidson. Uh, so with that, Tiffany, I'll turn it over to you for your initial remarks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thank you to Roy and MBR for having me here today. Um, I know the topic today we're addressing is a military contingency, and of course this would be a nightmare scenario not just for Taiwan, but also for the United States and its allies and partners in the region, um, and perhaps even for China. Um, I do want to echo Admiral Davison by saying that perhaps the military option is the least appealing, if not, but not the last resort option for the PRC. Um, in my view, the PRC's preferred strategy would be essentially winning without fighting. Um, if that's using a combination of military, economic, and political coercion to compel Taiwan to seek a future that is closer to its preference of unification. And we see that the PRC has developed a toolbox of uh, means to pressure Taiwan across different realms. And, you know, that probably warrants our attention as much as sort of the worst day scenario uh, that we discussed. I mean, thinking about war and peace, these are not sort of two dichotomies. I mean, there's sort of a spectrum of activities in between them. Um, we generally call them gray zone activities, and that's what we see with almost daily uh, PLA Air Force intrusions across the median line or into Taiwan's ADIZ. Um, so as Admiral Davidson said, we do have to balance our thinking for Taiwan military contingency, which is the worst day, with really what Taiwan needs to deter China's day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, pressures. So I know we're supposed to be talking about Taiwan's capabilities, so uh, maybe just a few points. So thinking about Taiwan's capabilities to deter and defeat a possible invasion, I mean, that is increasingly a high bar. Um, U.S. assessments, you know, whether you look at the China Military Power Report, it's very clear that the PLAs continue to develop proficiencies across pretty much all warfighting domains um, with the goal of uh, sort of denying U.S. Uh, uh, military power in the first island chain of which Taiwan is central to. Um, PLA modernization has very much been geared towards a Taiwan military contingency. Um, and, you know, the kind of contingencies that we are concerned with is everything from blockade to a possible invasion to the PLA seizing Taiwan's outer islands. And the, uh, uh, the PLA military modernization has really continued, I think, to widen this capability gap between the Taiwan and the PLA. And uh, to address this, Taiwan has undertaken some of its own efforts to bolster its own defense capabilities. The Admiral talked about some of them. Um, you know, these include ongoing reforms, such as the transition to the all-volunteer force and uh, with the reserve force, um, updating and adding to its equipment um, 
both through arms sales and development of indigenous programs, um, such as the submarine program and its own indigenous missile programs. And notably, uh, a recent increase in defense spending of 14% up to 2.4% of GDP, which is still sort of far short of the 3% golden standards that the US has called for for several years, but nevertheless is a fairly significant increase. Um, as the Admiral also mentioned, uh, there's an increasing focus um, in the United States on Taiwan uh, pursuing asymmetric warfare. And to an extent, some of these were captured in the previous overall defense concept, which is um, now less of a term of reference, I believe. Um, the Ukraine was very much a wake-up call on how a war between a small country and a much larger, better equipped adversary can play out. This has added to the calls for Taiwan to adopt uh, more asymmetric weapons. And these generally refer to categories of weapons that are nimble, survivable, uh, mobile, and relatively low cost. Um, so this is uh, a bit of a change from the previous acquisitions from Taiwan that have focused on your traditional uh, big ticket items. And in a Taiwan contingency, there's of course going to be a major role for the United States. I think the United States is taking a Taiwan military contingency much more seriously. We've seen uh, mentions of possible timelines, 2027 or uh, a little bit further out, and it's much more seen as an urgent problem. Um, the general framework and policy approach has not changed, as the Admiral mentioned. Um, actions are fairly consistent with the longstanding One China policy. And you know, the US has always long expressed an interest that the differences between two sides of the strait should be negotiated peacefully and settled peacefully. And any use of force would definitely um, contravene this very important uh, US interest in the Taiwan Strait security. And as a result, we, you know, we've seen much stronger statements. We've seen President Biden say a few times, reaffirming uh, the United States' commitment to Taiwan and involvement in the Taiwan Strait crisis. Uh, we've seen greater congressional support in the forms of visits and legislations to deepen U.S.-Taiwan relations. And I think also importantly, there's been a real shift of public opinion uh, here in the United States uh, where there's a greater support for Taiwan in the public space, as well as um, a less favorable view of China and more concern about China as a threat. And this perhaps leads on to a following conversation about U.S. capability in a Taiwan Strait crisis, because, you know, we've established there's a clear U.S. interest, but I think the question really remains, what will the United States do? And to an extent, this kind of depends on some of the factors that might lead into a crisis. but. The U.S. is um, legally required under domestic law under the Taiwan Relations Act to maintain the capacity uh, to resist a resort to use of force that would um, jeopardize the security of the people on Taiwan. So whatever the U.S. Um, will do in a cross-strait military contingency is increasingly complicated, of course, by the PLA's position. Um, but you know, this opens up opportunities for conversations about what kind of capabilities the United States needs to complicate PLA operations and also compensate um, for the sort of sheer geographic distance um, between the United States and the Taiwan Strait. And last point, you know, it's not just um, the United States, but there's a greater anticipated role for U.S. allies and partners. Um, who are supportive of Taiwan in the contingency. The U.S. can play a greater role in regionalizing, if not internationalizing Taiwan Strait security by engaging uh, U.S. allies and partners and like-minded countries. You know, the U.S. can kind of create shared understandings of the security challenges and of what is at stake. The U.S. can encourage the presence of other countries in the Taiwan Strait, and we've seen this um, with the naval presence um, from Australia, Canada, just to name a few in the Taiwan Strait. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you know, when we're talking about Taiwan's ability to deter China, I mean, Taiwan's forced modernization and political will is an important part of it. Um, but, you know, also as important is the complicating factor, I think, from China's perspective is involvement from the United States and increasingly possible um, from other countries like Japan and perhaps even Australia in a Taiwan Strait crisis. So I'll end there.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Those are very comprehensive remarks, and I think Kitch and Jim will both hit on a couple points and dive a bit deeper on those. Um, so, Kitch, over to you for kind of the Taiwan perspective. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Tiffany. That was amazing. Um, I think, you know, for my part, I'll dive more into the Taiwan aspect. And uh, before I begin, I would like to provide some you know, background on basically you know, the Taiwanese military. So. Um, one thing I think everybody needs to know is that Taiwanese military begins as an authoritarian military you know, under Chiang Kai-shek and transition into a democratic one as it is now. And one of the uh, enduring legacy is you got very bad uh, strategic integration. So ways, ends, and means. So, and very good at programming, you know, because you, you learn your PPBS, PPBOE system uh, from the US. So no problem with acquisition, no problem with running programs. Really bad at connecting, you know, policy to the operational level where rubber meets, meets the road. And the other thing we need to know is that each service is, as the Emerald pointed out, jointness could definitely be improved. Each service basically do their own thing. Uh, threat plan, you know, threat assessment, and then you submit your requirements, and everybody gets to, you know, uh, do what they want. If you look at the Guan plan, the island defense plan, it's pretty much divided by each service, and that could definitely use some improvement. And another, you know, um, consequences of a bad SI is that um, the last national security strategy was from 2008. Um, that was actually like in 2006, finally revised in 2007, 2008. And then you have the NDS and QDR mandated, you know, by, um, in a later era, but they don't really serve as a vehicle to form consensus. It's more like... Uh, every branch was consulted uh, on what they want, and then you piece together a seemingly coherent article. Um, with that got out of the way, we can start talking about the recent reforms. Um, there's three major items, the reserve reform, the one-year conscription, and some acquisition items. Uh, for the reserve reform, um, the salient changes are basically eight additional infantry brigades and the change of 14, uh, to a 14-day training regime and the establishment of the uh, OAL Defense Mobilization Agency, and also moving basically the uh, AFRC, the um, Armed Forces uh, Reserve Command under the Army. And the problem here I always ask is like, what's the assessment that leads to uh, the ultimate decision that eight infantry brigades gonna make a difference in deterrence? And that leads to my SI question, you know, this is not comprehensively assessed. And just because of, you know, uh, basically the, uh, the, the, um, the sort of uh, legacy we have from the Army, um, the entire system is geared toward the Army. So that means Air Force, Navy, technical, arm, te technical armed forces got shortchanged in terms of reserve training. Uh, the one-year conscription, it, it's definitely, you know, uh, the resumption is definitely a good thing. We definitely need the manpower. But the problem here is that when the story comes out, you don't have a comprehensive plan. Everybody starts scheming, like planning what they need to do with these people. And uh, so that results in a waste of manpower. There's not, not an overcom overall comprehensive plan. And it exacerbates uh, the training issue already, you know, already like produced by uh, the need for the reserve reform, right? Uh, you're training a more additional infantry brigades. You don't have enough ranges. You don't have enough instructors. Uh, all the rangers are outdoors. Uh, when it rains, you can't shoot. When it's a holiday, you can't shoot. And, you know, like, that brings us to acquisition. Like, some of the acquisition process we already went through, as Samuel mentioned, and, you know, we discussed before, and Russell's question about FMF actually pointed out, um, it takes a long time to change your acquisition. So right now, since last year, after the NDAA mandated this, all that's being able to actually do is to increase spare parts, munitions, um, and, like, and, that, and that's, that's realistic because that's the fastest way to improve readiness. And so I'm going to talk about some problems and how, for example, the U.S. and Japan could actually contribute to uh, the solution of these problems. The first and foremost problem, I think, is morale. Everybody knows this, and not a lot of people talk about it, openly at least. Um, when I talk about morale, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, the lack of will to fight. There's definitely the will to fight. Lower-level, mid-level officers, O5 and below, they all want reforms. They all want to fight. Your average, your average person on the street, they all want to fight. Civil defense organizations, uh, military training bases, if you go there, you see like women and grandma signing up for training, and they drag their men with them. So that's definitely there's will with there's will there. But the problem is like you know, uh, like at the higher level, you got planning problems, you got systemic problems, right? So somewhere it's stuck. And I'm not blaming these off higher level officers' breasts. I know a lot of them work you know 18 hour days, 18 hour days, seven days a week during peacetime. 
a lot of them actually got you know, developed medical problems and some of them even died. So you can't say like, you know, they're not working, they're, they're not working hard enough. This is a system, systemic problem. This is a legacy that we have to deal with. On the civil military side, there's a lack of understanding between the administration, political side, and the military side. Again, I'm not blaming any, any, any side. This is just a problem that's been persisting for a long time. And we're you know, probably due to actually have, have a solution on that. And uh, you know, this leads, leads to like, transparency and supervision problems. From the legislative Yuan side, if you look at the numbers, you have around 30 to 40 legislative assistants that's actually looking into a problem affecting 23 million people. And they're not even full time on this. And they're the only line of defense against, against any malfeasance or any sort of you know, um, like expertise that requires outside intervention. And lack of transparency on what, what cannot and can be discussed on the you know, military issue, right? So for example, can I talk about order of battle? Can I talk about the latest reform on combined arms brigade and, and what they do? Some people can, some people cannot. The fact, the, 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 the way that you're, you're not drawing this line clearly enough uh, leads to, you know, like, leads to basically like a barrier on discussing this. A lot of people want to be in, like, and that leads to a perception from uh, the, the crowd that, you know, you're not serious on this, and that leads to a morale issue. Morale issue is the center of gravity of the situation. And so what can our allies, the U.S. and Japan, do? You gotta have boots on the ground, right? Um, we understand that, you know, U.S. military presence in Taiwan is not ideal, that violates the uh, strict ambiguity principle. And we're not talking about military presence in Taiwan. We're talking about having, you know, like exchanges, like, uh, like the one that's being arranged between legislative Yuan and, and the parliament, right? You have people on the ground, you have people embedded in different parts of the agency. They have to be able to see, people have to see, like, you know, uh, things can be done differently, and it still works. People have to have hope, they have to understand, like, you know, this works. And, you know, that, you, you can't have, like, you know, that without people basically embedding on the ground on, in a significant number. And the second part about this, uh, what U.S. can do is in terms of, like, you know, the defense responsibility, right? So we understand, like, you know, um, TRA basically mandates that the U.S. has to have the capability to respond. But intention here also matters in terms of Taiwan's intentions, in terms of Taiwan's morale, right? Because I, I often talk about to people, like, this is not a reasonable ask. You're basically, you're basically saying, well, China might actually invade you, and with an overwhelming force, I may or may not come to your aid. This, this is not a reasonable ask for any people, right? Like even with a people with Taiwan's resilience. But what I'm saying here is that behind closed doors, at least, you know, behind confidential you know, like conversations, you could have at least clarify who does what. Right? Fire coordination is a constant problem. Uh, joint operation can be attempted on a small scale, right? A lot of information sharing, you know, uh, common operational picture can be tested out, like all of this along with Japan, and that's, that brings us to Japan, right? Japan is a very interesting case because there's so much they could potentially do. Intel sharing, you know, uh, joint operation on securing, you know, sea line of communication. Uh, it's also the closest uh, major hub for supplies. I'm not even talking about military ones. We're talking about, you know, uh, your average, like, energy, your average food, supplies. And potentially, you know, during uh, sea line communication issues, like when the uh, Taiwanese Ar Navy has to escort or break a blockade, there's Japan, that's the closest ally you have. And a lot of intelligence sharing can be done and, you know, even like cooperation can be done with humanitarian assistance programs uh, or MUTAL, right? Military operations other than war. You don't have to do this as a military exercise. Uh, thank you. Good. Thank you. I think that's a great segue into Jim, who's going to talk more about kind of the U.S.-Japan alliance and Japan's internal debate on Taiwan. Great. Terrific. Thanks, Rachel. And, uh, Thanks to you and Ali and NBR for including me on that trip. It was my first trip to Taiwan and uh, uh, had a big impact uh, on me, and, and uh, I learned a lot from it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Japan's debates on how to potentially get involved with or be prepared for a, a Taiwan contingency. There's no doubt that the Russia's invasion of Ukraine has uh, uh, made more tangible for policymakers in Japan and the public, uh, what the potential um, impact could be uh, and the potential for, for China to, to use military force 
uh, to try to force the issue on Taiwan. So they've responded with a new national security strategy, new national defense strategy that came out uh, at the end of last year. And I want to talk very briefly about what has changed as a result of, of these new strategies, what has not changed, and what does that mean? So in terms of what has changed, uh, the way that Japan refers to or uh, describes its concern about China is uh, much sharper, more specific. They talk about China as the greatest strategic challenge. Uh, not necessarily a threat, per se, but um, this is strong language for Japan. There's also mention in there of a diminished view of the United Nations, a recognition uh, that, that the United Nations is not functioning properly, so Japan has to help itself, and Japan has to strengthen its uh, alliance with the United States. Uh, big boost to the defense budget. It's going to go up 26% uh, next fiscal year. It's the largest single year increase. Looking to try to double the defense budget um, over the next five years. Still some questions about whether they'll be able to, to manage that. Um, and they're putting a lot of money into readiness, um, in improving uh, munition stockpiles, uh, hardening uh, uh, facilities and, and the like. Um, developing a counter-strike capability to be able to strike targets from farther away. Planning to buy Tomahawk, up to 400 Tomahawk, U.S. Tomahawk missiles. Um, developing a permanent joint headquarters for the first time uh, in uh, post-war history for Japan. Stepping up uh, training activity with the United States in the Southwest Islands itself. They just conducted the Iron Fist uh, exercise, which, which used to always take place in, out in California. Uh, with U.S. Marines, now they've done it actually in this, using the maps of the area that they would potentially be uh, 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 working in. Investing in cybersecurity, revamping uh, that infrastructure, uh, space infrastructure for, for um, uh, defense-related needs. And then also I would put public views in this category of change. There is um, more public acceptance of this kind of uh, defense uh, investment which we haven't seen so much before. In terms of what hasn't changed, the legal structure has not changed in Japan in terms of how uh, they would be able or authorized to engage with the United States in response to a, a Taiwan contingency. Um, the exclusively defense-oriented policy that Japan uh, uh, takes, which means everything would be the minimum necessary uh, uh, use of force to protect itself, um, uh, a kind of a last resort type of when no other means is necessary uh, uh, is available to, to deal with these threats. Uh, the political limitations, especially within Okinawa, um, the U.S. is looking to have much more maneuverability and distributed uh, action in and around uh, Taiwan as a part of their strategy to deal with China's capabilities. Um, it's not very easy to get access to civilian bases, uh, other types of, of um, shared use of facilities in, in, in and around Taiwan. So uh, the demographics, Japan has not increased the number uh, of, of soldiers necessarily, the strength of Japan's economic relationship with China itself, and uh, concerns about loss there. And so I would also put public views in the not changed category, that there's, it's, it's questionable how much uh, uh, Japan would, would be willing to go um, in, in, in lockstep with the United States to respond. So in terms of what this means, simply I think this is about leveraging uh, what has changed um, in order to overcome what has not uh, changed. So we have to make as much uh, uh, use of these changes um, and, and uh, closer integration of U.S.-Japan uh, 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 carrying out of missions and planning and, and being prepared and not just in a defense uh, area, I think the role is, is, is more broad than that. So I was asked about um, the role of the alliance in, in a Taiwan contingency. You know, I think first and foremost, the goal of the alliance is peace, stability, and prosperity. That's the goal, that's what it's, it's there to try to accomplish. The role that the alliance plays in accomplishing that is deterrence. Uh, I don't think the U.S. can deter uh, Chinese military action against Taiwan if China feels that that's the resort, that they have to resort to that means without uh, a close cooperation and coordination uh, with Japan. This is not, uh, does not mean that Japan is going to be you know, military, militarily directly involved in a, in a fight in and around Taiwan, but there's a variety of support roles 
um, and enabling roles that they can play. But it's also about striking this diplomatic and military balance of, of trying to create doubt in China's minds that they could succeed, so strengthening deterrence, but without tipping um, China's perception that, that, uh, that the status quo is in danger of changing or that they have to take some kind of action because uh, uh, the allies are, are moving so strongly. Um, I'll skip, because uh, I want to save some time for questions. Um, there was a question about, uh, was asked of me, like, what could Japan by itself, Japan-Taiwan relations, how might that evolve uh, in the near future, um, and what Japan could do uh, you know, before some kind of contingency happens. And you know, it's interesting, this past Monday, uh, Prime Minister Kishida gave a, a, a speech in India. Uh, they unveiled what they call their new plan for the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, and if you look at the pillars of their plan, uh, there are four pillars. It's principles for peace and rules for prosperity, addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way, uh, multi-layered connectivity, and a, basically a freedom of navigation pillar or a freedom of the seas. But in particular, this second pillar, addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way, all the subcategories of that uh, area, of that topic, climate and the environment, food security, global health, disaster prevention, disaster response, cybersecurity. These are uh, all areas that Japan could deepen its engagement. And I think one thing we learned on the trip is that there is a, a desire and a hunger on the part of Taiwan to, to really move forward and match the rhetoric behind political support in Japan for Taiwan to, to be manifest itself into more concrete substantive interaction at higher and higher levels. And it could be in all these other areas that are not necessarily uh, military, but, but deepening, deepening uh, those connections. In the back, they, they list all the different parts of the world that they're going to engage with on the strategy. Taiwan is not listed here. And you know, I think that's, is there a way to specifically uh, embed Taiwan into Japan's new free and open Indo-Pacific approach, to me, that's where the opportunity lies, uh, both between Japan and Taiwan and within the alliance as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to all three of our panelists for really insightful remarks. Sorry. <laughs> my, my microphone. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I do want to open it up to audience Q&A. And just a reminder to all of our virtual participants that if you do have a question, to submit it via email at events at mbr.org. And I already see a couple questions coming up. But before we do, I'm going to take the prerogative as moderator to ask the first one. Um, so pulling on threads from all of you, you've all mentioned kind of non-military means, uh, gray zone coercion. And so Taiwan, and then I think Admiral Davidson has also mentioned that Taiwan faces the threat of like the worst day, but also the daily incursions, the daily gray zone and course of tactics. But responding to every single course of action requires a significant use of resources, and it will become hard to sustain in the long term. Um, how do you suggest, maybe Kitch, um, Taiwan prioritize its response to gray zone tactics? And Tiffany and Jim, how can the United States and Japan more effectively support Taiwan in the gray zone? So I think it's important to understand one thing, right? Like, we talk about status quo, but across the Taiwan Strait, status quo was never China's uh, intention. They intend to eventually invade and take over Taiwan. That's fairly obvious to everyone involved. So if there ever was a status quo, that's because Taiwan is keeping up with the change, Taiwan and its allies. And it's very important to recognize that. We want to maintain status quo, but that involves actually uh, providing sufficient deterrence, but also um, you know, do not provide sufficient uh, um, provocation on that matter. And that goes to like, you know, the gray zone tactics and uh, non-military like, measures we should take. Um, I, would have, I would want to point out, um, actually in the past month or two, you can see significant ramp up. Uh, this is less visible on, on media, but you can see significant ramp up in uh, information operations and, and influence warfare that's been conducted against Taiwan specifically. Uh, you can see a lot of these in, uh, in less than refined methods that's been conducted within the island. And uh, the, the issue with this is that it all goes down to, it all goes back to the uh, central problem I was talking about earlier, morale, like morale of the people. It's the people's will to fight. That, that's your central, you know, that's your central thesis for how you can actually keep Taiwan safe, how you can basically collaborate with your, uh, with your allies. 
And for that to happen, a lot has to happen on the ground. Uh, you know, like uh, your collaboration with the allies, the primary problem here is trust. Not just to basically convince the Taiwanese government that, yes, we, we, we're on solid ground, the deterrence works. But the Taiwanese people have to believe that. And in order to do that, in order to achieve that, you have to have significant presence. As I mentioned before, it's not, it's not just, you know, it's not just delegations here and there. You need to have uh, people at every level to talk, to understand. So civilian engagement on that, in, in that sense, you know, um, and economic engagement have the ancillary effect of actually improving that. So, thanks. Thanks. Um, maybe take me first and then Jim. Sure. Um, yeah, I think picking up, um, you know, where Kitch left off, I think, you know, when we're looking at gray zones, I mean, the purpose of these is to really coerce the people in Taiwan and sort of compel them to behave in a certain way, right? So I think the purpose of support from other countries would be to maintain Taiwan's option to continue on with the status quo. So when China is pushing really hard in one sphere, um, especially in terms of military coercion, you know, how do we deepen support for Taiwan in other spheres to kind of help balance that? Um, as Kitch mentioned, I think the economic side is really important. I mean, I think business and trade. I think that's the heart of relationships in Asia, and that's what a lot of Asian countries beyond the U.S. allies and partners who care about democracy, but other Asian countries care about commerce and trade. Um, so, you know, that includes everything from uh, deepening U.S.-Taiwan um, economic relationship to thinking about ways of getting Taiwan more enmeshed into regional trade structures. Um, you know, other ways to boost Taiwan's deterrence, um, thinking about international space. I mean, I think what happened last week, this week with Honduras, I mean, that should not be happening. Um, so, you know, helping Taiwan maintain its international autonomy and international space, I would say it's another one. And I think lastly, uh, the United States and its allies, you know, we're seeing stronger statements and positions, as Jim mentioned, with Japan, we're seeing similar statements coming out of Australia too. And I think that's a really important first step, but you know, what is the next step after that? And I would say, you know, a few things where, you know, implementing actions such as coordinating um, deeper on the military level, especially uh, preparing for joint operations um, in a Taiwan contingency. And, you know, non-militarily talking about how do we meaningfully impose costs on China um, if such a contingency were to happen. I mean, I think that we saw from the Ukraine example, that's something that is worth discussing and coordinating ahead of time. So. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, obviously Japan is no stranger to uh, gray zone pressure tactics uh, from China, dealing with scrambles and, and uh, naval incursions, um, maritime incursions all the time around its territory. So it's really, we did have some specific conversations during the trip, and while there is some information sharing that goes on between Japan and, and, and Taiwan, uh, it was definitely felt that that could be um, more uh, regular, uh, uh, more detailed, uh, not as ad hoc, and, and so I think the, the information sharing, domain awareness piece, best practice, um, including on the cyber side of things, is, is probably where uh, uh, the, the best opportunity is. And the other point to bring up is that, you know, Japan is, has been trying to engage Taiwan on some discussions about, you know, what if there's a crisis and how do we get Japanese out of uh, Taiwan? Um, the Taiwanese would also like to talk about how do you get supplies and other things into Taiwan uh, if there's a crisis. So this kind of crisis management, but it could be under the, the, the guise essentially of uh, disaster relief, uh, disaster prevention, other types of, of crisis management just writ large could be, uh, could be an area. And um, sorry, I just want to add one point actually because before this I was having a fantastic discussion with uh, Ken Allen over there. Um, and we talked about like basically gray zone tactics around Taiwan, the constant, you know, plaf, um sorties. Mm -hmm. And I think one point that most people miss is this is also imposing a virtual cost, a virtual attrition on the Chinese Air Force itself, on their training, on their equipment, on their people. They might be able to take it, but there is a significant cost to them uh, that people are ignoring. Mm -hmm. And it's actually at the detriment of their own training and capability. So. Um, all right, I think we'll open it up to audience questions. Um, do the woman in the dress and then Michael. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a Taiwanese um, student from Georgetown University. So um, speaking of the lessons learned from Ukraine, we have seen that the Ukraine has utilized its unmanned area vehicles to combat and resist a superior number, like, to, to resist the um, U.S. 
to resist the Russians' capability, and we know that the um, Ministry of Zhongshan Science and Technology Institute have recently developed new UAV technology, and the Ministry of Defense of Taiwan has also uh, released its like 3,000th contract of UAVs to the Taiwanese industry. However, we know that this kind of gap cannot be filled in short time. So, what is the U.S. and its allied strategy in order to support the Taiwan's UAV or counter UAV capability? Thank you. Um, or Kitsch, go first. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Talk so like, I, I think it's important to talk about, like, you know, um, in terms of uh, operational considerations, you don't just talk about one single weapon system, right? You talk about the entire dynamic uh, from tactical to operational to strategic. Yes, you know, uh, UAV at the beginning of the war provides significant tactical advance, advantages to the people who knows how to use it. But when's the last time you saw a TB2 drone actually, like, you know, uh, did anything recently? It, it's a fairly easy response to utilize your current system to and device tactics on the battlefield to counter that. Right? Even for some something as slow and as cumbersome as the Russian army, I think Taiwan could do better. And so yes, we're doing that. And yes, uh, there are a lot of, you know, um, basically like um, exchanges and discussions with the U.S. on certain topics on the tactical level. This included. Um, but I think we, we need to basically look at the larger picture as I was talking about. We have to have a comprehensive plan on where you allocate your resources to most effectively increase your military power before we can actually, you know, delve down to the specifics, which Taiwan is actually fantastic at. What we lack is the people who can marry our fantastic technical understanding to policy considerations. And I'd just add that UAV technology is on the agenda of longer-term U.S.-Japan uh, defense research and development. Now they're looking at it more in the context of um, loyal wingman type of technology with future fighters, but um, maybe there's, there's, there's an area for if, if those industrial connections could be made, um, that that could also be a, a source of potential partnership with, uh, with Taiwan uh, defense capability. Well, um, I... <laughs> I think the two gentlemen have made a lot of really good points, but I would say, I mean, you can look at UAVs as part of an asymmetric capability, but I think, um, echoing what Kitch said, you know, we really have to look at this as a comprehensive strategy. And, you know, I would also argue, you know, when we focus on these newer emerging technology platforms, like, let's not forget the lower cost, uh, more basic uh, systems and technology that would actually come into play in the event of a contingency such as an invasion where the PLA has landed and we need a resistance force. You know, it's not all going to be relying on sort of high te new technology. It could be something as simple as, I don't know, blowing up a bridge as we've seen the Ukrainians uh, do. So, you know, focusing on this uh, civil defense force, um, using guerrilla tactics, mm -hmm. leveraging Taiwan's terrain, which is not always UAV friendly, for example. I mean, I th would, my answer would be let's look at UAVs in that sort of broader context. Michael Gordon, Wall Street Journal. I have a question on Taiwan and its relevance, on Japan and its relevance for Taiwan scenario. In the two and two, the U.S. Um, took some steps with Japan to, there's going to be a Marine Littoral Regiment in Okinawa by 2025. There's going to be an Army boat company to move stuff at, at some point in the future. What, and this has applicability to a range of scenarios, potentially one involving Taiwan. What do you think the next step could be that the U.S. could take with Japan with relevance um, to uh, the defense of Taiwan by enhancing U.S. capabilities. For example, um, the, US, the Air Force has a program of agile combat employment to disperse aircraft throughout the Pacific, but doesn't in, at this point include Japan, airfields in Japan. What do you think that next step could be uh, to help Taiwan between these two countries? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's that's one of them. I referenced this issue of, of um, mobility and access. You know, the, the, that's on the agenda in the alliance this year, but it's um, it's it's going to be it's going to take time, and it's going to be difficult for for Japan to really deliver that. There actually also needs to be potentially some legal changes that would allow Japan to preposition or allow access to some of these uh, civilian airfields before a crisis strikes. Right now, the language in, the, in the, the law pretty much requires a fight to start before you can actually uh, have the legal authority to, to do that. 
Um, so Japan is looking at that, but I think you know the next step, and it is on the agenda in the alliance right now, is modernizing our command and control relationships between the allies. So we're, we're, we are already not well prepared to deal with integration or collaboration on Counter-Strike if the watercraft company is going to begin moving not only U.S. men and materiel, but also Japanese self-defense forces and materiel, you know, how that gets determined, how that gets decided. A Marine littoral regiment out on the tip of the periphery with a lot of capability, a lot of early warning uh, potential and a, and a long, some long-range strike uh, potential. How does the, the, the response of that MLR get decided and determined and coordinated within the alliance, our, our 1950s era parallel command structure does not necessarily uh, get us there. Uh, this permanent joint headquarters that Japan is developing is an opportunity to, to provide a connection point uh, potentially to something that is, is either in Hawaii or is maybe some kind of new joint task force that becomes uh, staffed to some extent in Japan. So there's, this is a whole new area uh, that's kind of just beginning, but I think if you don't get that right, then all these capabilities are less effective uh, anyway. All right, um, let's take these two questions at once and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, I'm, I'm Mike Fonte. I work for the Democratic Progressive Party here in Washington as the director of their office. Thanks for a great presentation. Keisha, I want to ask you a bit about your question on morale uh, in Taiwan and the question of whether the U.S. may or may not come to our aid. Uh, it seems to me President Biden has been clear on that point, and I guess the context is not strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity so much as dual deterrence, right? The U.S. believes if China, if China uses unprovoked action, the U.S. will be there. If Taiwan unilaterally declares independence, goodbye, you take care of yourselves. So I think that's, that's the way I see that. And I think the four times that the president has said he would be there seems to me to be a very effective point of view. Do you buy that or not? Um, so I think it's very interesting. And thank you for reminding me that the correct terminology is dual deterrence. Um, actually, the State Department tried to discourage everybody from s saying strategic ambiguity before, but I guess that stuck, so. They uh, never use it themselves. <laughs> yes, exactly. And one of the things I actually forgot to say uh, before is that I think it's very important, I'm, I'm not advocating one way or another, but I think it's very important to actually keep in mind that uh, dual deterrence, the policy itself, has a, an implicit cost on explaining the position of Taiwan and the U.S. to its own people. It's less of a problem now because all attention are focused on this. But it has a cost. It has a cost on the morale, on people's trust, right? Uh, there's study done, basically, uh, on the Taiwanese population uh, that uh, if the U.S. were to openly declare their support, uh, you know, for uh, Taiwan contingency, uh, what, what do you think Taiwan, Taiwan's chances are? There's a signi uh, statistically significant result that Basically, you know, Taiwan, Taiwanese people believe they will win. Like, there's a, there's, there's a change. So that has, a, you know, uh, an effect on the morale as well. But in reference to basically President Biden's, uh, President Biden's uh, expression, yes, I, I do agree that, you know, like, it's very unlikely that's, that this is, um, this is just, you know, like something he forgot and said, and they have to walk that back. I, my personal belief is that, that that is a sort of, you know, a way to basically express their opinion on the matter. It's sort of shifting, uh, shifting the scale without doing that too much. It, it's all, I, I believe it's all part of this delicate play between, you know, like you have to have sufficient deterrence, but not so much that China believes that uh, it doesn't have any chances with Taiwan anymore. And, but again, this is like, the, this has the deleterious effect of affecting Taiwanese morale. Uh, your, po your average public wants very snappy comments, very, you know, uh, strong opinions on whether is, are they going to come or not? So that, that's the question you have here. And, um, the, but I, I do believe like, you know, systematic changes within Taiwan with the help of an outsider, like, right? Like, because one of the problem is, uh, due to Taiwan's, uh, as you know, as Tiffany talked about before, due to Taiwan's international isolation, a lack of international space, uh, Taiwan's military and government for the past few decades basically only gets to play with itself, and that's a problem. You don't get to actually get exposed 
to uh, the international environment, to how other countries, how the government conduct affairs, and what is even possible, what can be changed, right? So that's, I think that, that's a way to basically you know, improve people's confidence, not just in the military, but in government decisions in general. And that could you know, contribute to an increase in resolve and confidence. Okay. Oh, last question as we're approaching time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Narupat Ratanakit. Uh, I'm a graduate student at American University. I have a, you mentioned about allies, right? And uh, I want to know your thoughts on the Philippines. Um, and the Philippines, you know, is, is very important, you know, is very close to Taiwan. So any thoughts on how, and, and obviously with the uh, base access, uh, five military base access, so what can, you know, uh, the Philippines could offer in, in the contingency with Taiwan? Just want your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the Philippines is, uh, the, the recent gains in strengthening the U.S.-Philippine relationship on that front uh, has been really important, and Japan itself has, has been stepping up its engagement steadily um, on the defense side with the Philippines, and I think that's highly evaluated both in all three countries. And there are some trilateral initiatives that are, that are moving forward as well. Um, I should also mention Japan and their new national security strategy has a, a plan to implement something which is instead of just overseas development assistance or ODA, they're looking at o um, overseas security assistance and ability to actually provide financing and funding to support coastal radars, other types of defense use products, not necessarily weapons per se, but um, there are, they've already been helping the Philippines strengthen its maritime domain awareness, but there's potentially more that could happen there that would provide a lot more um, uh, intelligence warning uh, capability for for the whole group of allies. Um, okay. but. Thank you, Tiffany. And Kitch, any last words before we wrap up? Uh, maybe just on the Philippines one. I mean, I absolutely agree with Jim. I think the goal here is to strengthen the capacity of the Philippines, especially given that it's from a very practical matter, it's geographically further away from Taiwan than Japan is. So the proximity matters in an urgent crisis. Um, and, you know, the Philippines obviously has had its own tensions with China in recent years and um, navigating, I think, the domestic politics of the Philippines. I think that would be the challenge. Um, I guess I'll wrap this up by saying basically, you know, um, a lot of talks about this uh, ignores the fact that it ultimately comes down, if there ever was a Taiwanese contingency, uh, it ultimately comes down to Taiwanese people's will to fight. Um, and this could be a great extent be determined by the gray zone warfare, you know, the influence operations uh, that we're experiencing right now. And so uh, that should probably be, you know, our next uh, priority in terms of discussing how to shore up Taiwan's uh, ability to deter Chinese invasion. Because that factors into China's calculus on their next move as well. That's a great last point. Um, thank you all to, thank you to the three panelists and thank you to everyone for joining. Um, and thank you Admiral Davidson and Ali for your earlier discussion as well. Um.